Well, good morning. Thanks for having me on today. Ten days uh, left in the fiscal year, and I'm told we're on track for a surplus of about $800 million this year, Senator Tarr. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, before the governor adjusted his revenue estimate for this last special session, um, but um, yeah, from the regular session estimate, that's about where we are. Yeah, with his with his adjustment, what does that bring the number to in your estimates? It's probably going to bring it down somewhere between five and six hundred million. Um, so it, we he had uh, adjusted it down, or excuse me, had adjusted it up rather, revenue estimate by about a couple hundred million dollars to be able to do some of the things that we did in the. Um, special session that had to do with uh, Medicaid, res- or not Medicaid, but a human services reserve fund, uh, and then some highway supplementals. You folks get together in August, and I know that's going to be a heavy lifting session for you. Do you expect to spend all of that money in appropriations in August? No, you know, we, we haven't really gone through um, a, a very recent, recent being within the past week or so discussion on what the, the next surplus request will be. Uh, you know, when we uh, governor opened up the state of the state for uh, anticipating this fiscal year, he had a um, pretty much a pretty large Christmas list of things on the surplus items they had that we did not go through. And so um, we've done some of those things that the legislature agreed upon to this point. Um, but uh, for any additional requests right now or any change in those requests, I've not seen that list yet. Okay. Are you familiar with what some of them might be? Or at this point, is all of it off the table until there's an official request? Yeah, and, until it's an official request. Now, actually, it, we've not been given a heads up on what they might be at this point. Um, you know, some of the things we've done in the past, though, just to look at the way the legislatures looked at surplus items and when working with the governor. So um, in in years past, as we've gone through surplus items, what we've done is, is sit down and work with the governor's office and with the House and figure out where there would be an agreement on how to best use the surplus item or surplus funds. And the character of that, and you know, I've said this uh, many times on your all show here, the character of how we try to apply the surplus items as we spend those one-time dollars. We, we consider surplus revenue one-time money. So we either spend those dollars where they'll make us dollars so you don't have to raise a tax on the people of West Virginia in order to have improved revenue, or you spend them where it'll save money um, so that there's less uh, demand to the taxpayer for funding the services of government. So as we have some of those opportunities, I, I would imagine that's the, the same kind of flavor we would have here. Um, we've done, So a lot of that stuff has gone right through to assist with infra- infrastructure development and sewer, water, roads, broadband, those type of things um, to apply for um, making life uh, better for people in West Virginia and, and more attractive to industry. In regards to an income tax cut, when does all of that data come in and when is that calculation made? The trigger happens in August. Um, so, the, um, and what the trigger does is that that it goes through and looks at the state's economic growth relative to the rate of inflation, um, specifically CPI, as it's changed since the 2019 revenue. We come in, and you take you take um, severance tax revenue out of that. You don't consider severance tax with it. And if the economic growth is such that the revenues coming into the state absent severance exceed the cpi then it triggers a tax cut and it has to it has to exceed it by at least one percent because it's a it's to a whole percent tax cut and so as that happens what we're looking at right now we're anticipating it could be anywhere between zero and two percent on a tax cut and what that would mean in real numbers is somewhere between 22 and 44 million dollars um, and we're in that ballpark, and the way that it hits, the trigger hits in August, but the income tax runs on a calendar year, which means that, that the anytime there's a reduction, that initial reduction hits for half the fiscal year. That was a bit of a challenge in this past special set or uh, regular session, rather, when we were setting the budget because you really didn't know the size of that trigger, and if it would have hit at the full amount that it can, because it's capped at 10%. We could have been looking anywhere between a $240, $250 million reduction in revenue um, for the – once it kicked into a full fiscal year, half of that for half the fiscal year. So what we're anticipating now is probably that in uh, at a 2%, probably at the highest we would see, which in this, this coming fiscal year would be $18 million, um, about 
ish because it's uh, the uh, lion's share of those collections come in the second half of the year. And when you two percent uh, effectively means that if you're paying a hundred dollars in state income tax, you'd be paying ninety eight instead come the next fiscal year. Yeah, it reduces the it reduces yeah the the overall uh, revenue collected. So you know if you had we have somewhere anywhere between two point four and two point five billion dollars in income tax collections in the state of West Virginia. That's about forty percent of the revenue that comes into the general revenue fund of the state. And so if you hit a a full ten percent reduction, you'd be looking around two hundred forty million dollars. So it's uh, yeah. So if it's one uh, percent out of a ten dollars, then you're going to uh, excuse me ten percent out of ten dollars, you're going to see a dollar reduction. And if you go down to uh, um, one percent, it's going to be a ten cent reduction. So it's um, that's the way it works. Is based on those revenues. Gotcha, Mr. Gilstrap. The top tax rate in West Virginia now is what income tax rate? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's um, you caught me off guard just a little bit there. No, we were at six uh, six percent. I believe it's six and a half percent is what it was, and we've got it down now to the it's an effective rate of about five point two, I think. So if it's a two percent cut, does that about bring... about one tenth? Okay, so it'd be five point one percent. Right. Okay. Correct. That's All right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I get when once you start taking percentages off percentages, the math gets really yes. complicated. Because when you're two percent, you think, oh, yeah, are we going from five percent to three percent? No, right. that would be a forty percent reduction. Right, 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 that's, right. That's different. Yeah, I tell you, one of the things you learn in finance years is that you you try as much as possible is to follow the keep it simple, stupid method as you can, because mm -hmm. the more complicated you get with it, the the more difficult it becomes to explain, and the more difficult it becomes to get a, a measure passed. Right. So, um, so yeah, so we so we operate off that revenue number. So the big change is coming, uh, I guess, next February. New governor, uh, new representatives, or new legislators in general. So with with new elected officials come new priorities. How big of course correction do we expect to see with the with the new administration and the new uh, new legislature? You know, it's, uh, we, of course, going through the primary, I think the primary has pretty much determined the great majority of what will happen within the, the next governing body comes in West Virginia, both with the legislature and the governor's office. So I fully expect Patrick Morsey will be our next governor. Um, I've had a couple uh, conversations with um, Patrick since uh, since the primary election. And um, I know he's, he's focused heavily on economic development and, and can reducing um, the size of government while improving its efficiency. Uh, and that's the size being the cost of it. So I know that those are the things he's looking at uh, to really um, to get in at a process level. And then at the legislature side of things, um, I do believe that the, the body of the legislature took a, a more of a shift to the right um, as compared to what it has been here in the past couple of years um, with this new legislature. And that's not a bad thing. Um, I do think it's a bad thing that you guys lost Senate President Blair up there uh, for coming this next time. Uh, that's, uh, that's a huge loss for the state of West Virginia, both on uh, what we had with, for conservative policy and also economic policy. The guy's uh, really, really bright when it comes to getting business in West Virginia. Senator, on that note, would you have interest in being the next Senate president? I think it's, it's early for those discussions. Um, Senate President Blair is still very actively involved uh, with a lot of the initiatives that we've been taking on as a caucus over uh, the past several years. And some of those, those, those things don't stop. You know, Senate President's a full-time job, um, and especially when you're in a state that's, that is now in a growth mode like West Virginia has never seen in my lifetime. And so there's a, it's a, even, even at finance chair level, it's, a, it's an around-the-clock job, and a Senate President is even more demanding than that. So... Um, so right now we haven't slowed down as a caucus really to get into uh, that high-level discussion. I think that you're going to probably see those discussions around later fall. Um, I do know there are several people that are interested in it. But uh, I think uh, that's those, a lot of those discussions still yet are, are caucus-level kind of discussions. Mr. Harvey. Good morning, Senator Tarr. Um, Good morning. So potentially when a – if everything goes really well, there could be a potential – Anywhere from uh, you know eighteen million to up to a two hundred fifty million dollar reduction, does that require the the legislature to look at the budget differently? Like, does it have to account for that potential um, when it's building its base? Does it have to account for a potential reduction now? 
Yeah, it did. It, that, that confused us this past regular session when we were trying to figure out um, how much revenue we had to budget with. Um, it was challenging on a couple fronts. One was that we had a potential clawback through the U.S. Department of Education on some of the COVID monies that came through relative to the level of spend in education as compared to the level of spend in other agencies. And the reason was for West Virginia's funding formula. And that had a potential impact of about a $450 million reduction in revenue. So it was fairly significant. And so it, there was an uncertainty there. That's, that's since been resolved. Um, and with a waiver from the U.S. Uh, Department of Education to accept the spins that we've done that was outside and within the formula. Um, and it's just West Virginia's unique state in, in the way that we, we fund education. Uh, the second thing was the trigger. And I, I think that, uh, you know, anytime you go through and you move policy through, as we all know, you, you can put uh, a nice filet in at the beginning and you get sausage at the end. And so part of that sausage that happened with the income tax reduction was when the trigger would take effect. Because of the state's revenue cycle operates on um, our fiscal year, you know, it comes through and uh, hits halfway through the calendar year is when it would begin or end. And so the trigger kicks in in August, but the reduction wouldn't happen until January, which means it affects half your fiscal year. After, and, and you're not able to see that trigger until you're well done after session. And so you have to consider, well, what's the most revenue reduction that we could potentially see if the trigger hit in its full effect? Because at that point, it's really, especially being this new, to forecast that hitting that trigger is a little bit of a challenge. Um, so I think that uh, going forward, we're probably going to need to look at that trigger um, and set it to where maybe it, it hits – more on either the calendar um, year at the trigger level or it hits more on the fiscal year uh, as far as when it starts to kick in so that we have some predictability during regular session on uh, around that potential revenue reduction. And so, um, and we didn't, um, we had discussions about that coming in here to this special session just a little bit, but knowing that we have up to a 2% tax reduction coming, we didn't want to delay that for the people of West Virginia in any way because we certainly can afford that and the formula makes sure that you can afford it the way it's set up. Is the August special session going to be all about the budget or is there going to be some other priorities taken up at that time? Um, just recently there's there's been some talk of some things around uh, child care. If I'm sure you've all been following the story of um, Kennedy down in um, Boone County. It's a child, a 14-year-old child that uh, had lost her life in, in, in some just horrid circumstances. And so there's a, a lot of uh, discussion right now around uh, child safety uh, when it comes to somebody who may need um, supervision of the state, whether it be a child or family uh, or people who are under that care. And so that that's um, the media attention around that, which is well-deserved. Um has brought to light some discussions and processes we have to look at. So I think that coming in, which could probably see some things uh, around that, uh, that subject matter. Senator Tarr, I guess it was last year when leader Eric Halsolder helped lead, um, no pun intended, the mm -hmm. movement that set aside, I guess it was 500 and something million dollars when the income tax was enacted, the tax cut was enacted. And now I understand that that money is just kind of there. Uh, there'll be a new governor, uh, new leadership in the uh, in the Senate. What happens to that five hundred plus million dollars? Does it get spent before so, the end of this year, or does it just kind of stay out there earning interest in Treasury? No, it stays there earning interest in Treasury. So we've always had an income tax reserve fund, and the income tax. Well, I can't say always. I don't have as long as I've been around. We've had an income tax reserve fund. I, have, I don't know when it was actually started, but. It's something that is, is there as a practical matter to be able to pay out any taxes owed back to the citizens that they overpaid. So that income tax reserve fund, if um, when it comes around April time, or based in their taxes and October to businesses, that if there's a return that's needed in excess of the revenue that the state has available to pay it back to them, that reserve fund sits there so that those, those can be paid out of that. And prior to us depositing the $400 million into that, it had a little over $60 million. 
sitting in it, and it does earn interest. Um, with the income tax uh, triggering and cut plan that we put out there, as a matter of caution, to make sure that um, if for some, some reason that we went in and reduced the tax, say the trigger hit a full 10% and you reduced taxes by $250 million, and somehow there's some sort of economic circumstance in the following fiscal year that you weren't able to honor that if you didn't have that reserve fund. That reserve fund sits there for that purpose. And so it still has purpose sitting there as, as we're still very uh, young into this income tax reduction. And so um, it, it sits there now and it earns, but it's also a safety measure to make sure that we can um, have some security with reducing this tax as time goes by. What happens to the interest? Does it get scraped and, and reappropriated somewhere else, or does it stay in the fund? It, it stays in the fund. Um, it can get scraped um, and can go someplace else. You know, the legislature um, at any time can go in and, and tap any of these lines where we – or funds, rather – that we have set funds aside with the exception of the rainy day fund which has a lot of restrictions around it as to far as to what you can use it for and it also has a, it's, it's kind of a political hot button too it's not something you really want to go after because it is the, the state's um savings account uh, for like better it's your emergency fund so the the income tax reserve fund, as we said, it aside is kind of the same thing, but it's very specific. Instead of just to the general fund, it's very specific to being able to make sure that we have um, a safety cushion for those income tax reductions. So the more that it sits there and earns interest, the more secure it becomes and the better chance we have at looking at future tax reductions. Senator Finance Chairman Eric Tarr, our guest here on the program. Final couple of minutes with uh, Senator Tarr. Uh, Marilyn Chambers, one of our viewers on our Facebook live stream, TV10, asked the question about the DHS line item cuts and then how the money was reinstated during the session as a uh, lump sum uh, last month. As a Senate Finance Chairman, are you comfortable with the way that was done and the way that those funds will now be spent? I am, I, and I don't, I don't anticipate them needing to be spent, frankly. Um, and that's why I'm comfortable with it. Uh, the the way that was set up, it's it's another reserve fund. And so when we when we came in in the regular session, um, we reduced uh, line items by about 10 percent, uh, various line items throughout the Department of Human Services and the Department of Health, which are um, now two new divisions of what used to be Department of Health and Human Resources. And looking at those projections, the, um, from my point of view, and you ask how I'm feeling about it, so I'm going to give you my point of view instead of speaking, I think is what the legislature's opinion was by passing it, is that the appropriations that we made were appropriate to their needs. And so I, I don't think that we under-budgeted when we did those 10% reductions, and the reason it, that I don't think we under-appropriated is what came to light when we were doing our um, budget hearings for the agencies. Because when we broke up DHHR into three agencies, we broke into health services, health, and facilities, which are the state hospitals, we had a request for a $100 million improvement for contract nursing in the state hospitals, which was alarming. It was, it was, it was a huge improvement that we did anticipate that request coming to us. And so in that budget hearing, it came to light that what had been happening is the legislature had been appropriating money into health services into – items that um, any one of us would want our safety net populations to have available to them. And what was happening is behind the curtain is that those funds were being transferred to pay for other things rather than what the legislature appropriated them for. In this case, it was $100 million to contract nursing. And then over the past couple of years, we, as we dug a little deeper, we even found that some of the things like for IDP waiver, for instance, that they had been using it for paying for COVID tests in addition to contract nursing and other things that they had throughout their very sundry of things. And the level of appropriation we were giving for that, that specific item was greatly underspent relative to what we were appropriating over the past six years on the look back. And so when we appropriated this year's a 10% reduction, there was um, – consternation within the agency that they would be underfunded because the request was 10 percent higher so what we did is we said okay well let's what we'll do is we'll go in and put a reserve fund that sits here 
you can spend to that appropriation that we have because what happens is is um, there's quarterly distributions throughout the year relative to that appropriation. So if you if you do $100 million, you're going to have uh, $25 million over each four quarters that comes in as a revenue comes into the state. I've got about 30 seconds to wrap this up, Eric. So, Sure. So, so what we did is we set a reserve fund that in case that they didn't couldn't meet that need with that quarterly appropriation, reserve fund's there. I doubt it needs to be touched. I appreciate your explanation on that, and I appreciate your time this morning, too, and happy West Virginia Day to you. No, happy West Virginia Day. Happy West Virginia Day. Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr. Thank you. Have a great day, sir. Have a great day. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.